unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. We're taking our reading from Jeremiah, the 31st chapter. And I'm going to read from the 31st verse to the 32nd verse. The Bible says, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant, the Bible says, they break, or which my covenant they did break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. And my emphasis there is especially in the verses 32. So God, through the prophet Jeremiah, tells us of a future, a time coming in human history where he will change the covenant. He will give them a new covenant. And he says the kind of covenant that they're entering in the New Testament is not as the one that their fathers had in the day that he took them by the hand as he brought them up from the land of Egypt. So when he brings the children of Israel from the land of Egypt into the wilderness, he gives them a law. He gives them a covenant, you know, by the leading of the wonderful man of God, Moses. And the Bible says that in this nature of covenant that I want to make with them, he's saying that it has a contrast. It's not like the one which I made with their fathers. Why? Because the one with which I met with our fathers in the wilderness. The Bible says they did break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. They broke the covenant that I met with them in the days of the wilderness, presupposing that if we are discussing concerning the new covenant that Jesus Christ has brought, we see that God is seeking to build a covenant that is opposite from the one that was before, in a way, that it has certain tenets, certain characteristics, certain rules and patterns and principles that are different. And one of which most underlying is that the first one they broke or they were able to break. So he's bringing a covenant which men cannot or are not supposed to break. The one which is unbreakable is seeking to establish a better covenant the Bible says established on better promises. The new covenant is not just new because there's an old one. The new covenant is also a better covenant. The Bible calls it an excellent ministry which is established on better promises with the mediator which is Jesus Christ. So what is the excellency of this covenant? What is the greatness of this covenant? What makes the new covenant better than the old? The old, they could not continue into it. And so what happens? They broke it. They broke it. So even when Paul later is speaking about that same covenant, he says that they which were in could not be made perfect therein because they could not continue in it. It found fault in them. It wasn't a bad covenant per se, but it was a covenant that humanity could not fulfill. So he says, for if the first covenant was faultless, then should no place have been sought for a second. He says, finding fault with them. He now says, behold, the days come when I will make a new covenant of the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So he brings back the very thing I'm reading for you in Jeremiah. And he says, this is why he spoke it in Jeremiah. Because he found fault in the covenant because it made men with fault. So the problem was not the covenant per se. But the challenge was that this covenant could not make men perfect. It could not make men righteous. To tell you not to steal does not mean that it comes with the power not to steal. To tell you not to lie does not mean that it comes with the power not to tell a lie. 
And so, because this covenant made men faulty, the Bible says God found it with fault. Not as though in its own it was bad, but that it could not achieve that which it should have achieved because of its nature. So he says, look, that is why he speaks to us in Jeremiah. And later Paul picks that same line and brings it back later into Hebrews. And he's telling us, look, if there was no fault with the first covenant, there should have not been a need of a second. But the Bible says, but because he found fault with men, it was the very fault of the covenant. Not that it was to blame, but that to God it was not beneficial for man because it never presented man without fault or faultless. So it was of fault, not because in its own nature and sense it was of fault. Jesus says, uh, you know, who is good, save the law. The law is good. The law is good. It's not against humanity. It is for good. To tell you not to lie is a good thing because to lie is bad. But God has a problem with it and he can brand it faulty because it found fault with man. God loves man than the law. He loves us because we are created in his own image and likeness. So, Jeremiah now says, look, a time is going to come when I'm going to give you a new covenant. And he's saying, why? Because the old one, they broke. It was breakable. That means in the constitution of this new covenant, there has to be a provision wherewith a man should not break or cannot break or could not break. I pray to God that whoever is listening in will understand what that means to have a covenant which is unbreakable. So how do we leave a covenant which is unbreakable yet we still have a human weakness yet we still have a human inefficiency or what's the glory of the New Testament if in this covenant again he has built something that is breakable like the old and that's what we want to explore and I want to show you the power that comes in understanding that. In Matthew 21, the 42nd verse, the Bible tells us Jesus said unto them, Do ye never read in the scriptures that the stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, say I unto you, this is Jesus now, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Of course, Jesus, if I, I need to take you back a bit in that story, he was having a lot of contention with the Pharisees, with the religious leaders of that time. There was war. So in this contention, in these misunderstandings, these words are given by the master. And in the 44th verse, he says, And whosoever shall fall on this stone, the Bible says, shall be broken. But on whosoever it shall fall, it will ground him to powder. If you will read that in the message version, the verse 44. It says, whoever stumbles on this stone gets shattered, and whoever the stone falls on gets smashed. Okay? Now, remember, and I'm going to take us back. In the Old Testament, the law was written on tablets of stone. And there's a signification there. Because later, when we start to see the Christ coming as a stone, a chief corner stone, coming in the form of a stone as well, there's something God is trying to show us, and it's something that I want to take a journey of you to help you understand. In Exodus, the scripture tells us very clearly, the children of Israel have crossed from Egypt, and they are in a wilderness, and out of divine inspiration, Moses seeks to separate himself, to consecrate himself, so he leaves the children of Israel, and then he goes on the mountain, to seek God. The scriptures tell us that he was there for about 40 days and 40 nights. But after a couple of weeks before we get into the 40 days and 40 nights, the children of Israel are wondering, why is this fellow not coming back? Because our way and understanding of prayer is supposed to be a man goes up on the mountain and comes back. We see him, but this fellow is not appearing again. So they have a problem. Where is Moses? Where is he gone? And so for some random reason, an idea comes through the camp that it seems Moses had died there. 
And uh, what do the children of Israel do? They get Aaron and they tell him, you know, build us something to worship because we are worshippers. Human beings are worshippers by nature. If they're not given what to worship or who to worship, they will worship anything, you know. Scriptures tell us how the man of God goes to a city and finds foundations of different gods and they're all arrayed and another one had an inscription to the unknown God because human beings are naturally worshippers. Whether they know it or they don't, whether they worship from the dark side or the light side, human beings are naturally worshippers. So yes, they say, you know, make us something to worship. And so they collect all the gold in the camp and then they build a golden calf and then they start worshipping it. Meanwhile, God is dealing with Moses on the mountain. You see, God does not come down to rebuke them. He doesn't even waste his time on their ignorance. He continues dealing with the man of God. And then after that, the Bible says in Exodus 31 verses 18 that he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon the mountain two tables of testimony, tables of stone, which were written by the finger of God. So by the end of the 40 days and nights, he gives him two tables or tablets of stone which were written by the finger of God. And the scriptures now tell us that Moses descends. If I will skip into Exodus 32 now, which is the next chapter, to give you more details on this, of what I would seek to emphasize today. The 15th verse, Moses stand and went down from the mountain, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand, the tables which were written on both their sides, and on one side and on the other they were written. Verse 16, and the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon tables. If we will skip to verses 19, it came to pass that as soon as he came nigh unto the camp, he saw that golden calf that the children of Israel had built for God to worship and the dancing. And the Bible says, and Moses' anger waxed hot and he cast the tables out of his hands and broke them beneath the mountain. And he took the calf which they had made and burnt it in the fire and ground it to powder and strode it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink it. So you see, he comes down the mountain, he finds these guys worshiping a different God. And what does he do? He has the tablets of stone with which God has written with his own handwriting. And what does it do? Out of anger, he smashes those tablets and they break. Even with the writing of God, they are broken. They are broken to pieces. So there's no instruction of the children of Israel. This is the law God has given. You see? Now, for a student, you'd understand that the breaking of the tablets of stone with which had the writing of God on was a sort of miniature picture, a typification of what Jeremiah is speaking about here. In Moses breaking this, he's signifying that this shall be broken by the sons of men. No son of man can really reach or achieve the standard which God had set at that time. And there's a reason why God had sent the law. Because it is the only way he will appeal to the human heart and compel it to the knowledge that it should carry. That it can do nothing without God. It has no ability for self-righteousness. It has no ability for self-fulfillment. It has no ability in its own wisdom. It has no ability in its own potential. Man at his best, the Bible says, is altogether vanity. Even at your best state, you're still at your worst. Because you can't. So he's sending this to tell him, look, this is who you are. This is who you really are. So in Moses breaking these stones, these tablets of stone, boom, and then he breaks them down. It's the typification of man breaking the very thing with which God had sent to him. So it is now given that when Moses is angry, he goes back to the mountain another 40 days. And for those of you who read, the number 40 means trial. So he goes back to the mountain and he seeks God another 40 days. And in seeking God another 40 days, again in Exodus 34, the 29th verse, it came to pass that when Moses had come down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand when he came down from the mount, that Moses wished not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. Now, this is what happens. When the Bible says that he came down now with another two tables of stone in Moses' hand, it means that when the first tables of stone were written by God in his own handwriting and they were broken. 
Moses is angry with the children of God. He goes to the mountain. The scriptures tell us God tells Moses, now you're going to get another set of tablets of stone. And this one you shall write in your own hand. You shall inscribe with your own writing. With your own handwriting. This is not now my writing. It's the same law that I've given. It's not different from what I've given. But with this one, it is on the standard of your own writing. And the scriptures tell us now, like I said in the 29th verse, if you will read it also from the Amplified Version, he says, and it comes to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in his hand, he did not know that the skin of his face had shone and sent forth uh, beams by reason of his speaking with the Lord. Now we see in the second coming back, with the tablets of stone, we see his face beaming. We see his face shining. There's something about the glory of God that has surrounded this man. Although we know very well that this was a glory that could diminish. And so in the diminishing, he had found himself veiling. I think there's something connected to him inscribing with his own hand the very things that God had revealed to him concerning the law of Israel and the changing of his face this time because it had not happened before. But there's a mystery here. There's a difference between the law that God gives and writes in his own hands and the law with which God gives and it is written in the arm of flesh by a man who is of a fallen nature although his soul is connected to God. And people don't know that that is what actually remains. What preserves humanity is the law of God written with the hand of flesh not written by the hand of God. So when later Paul comes into the New Testament, he says, and you're a written epistle, known and read by all men, not written by ink, but written by the Spirit. God is trying to tell us that there's a difference between that which is given of God as inspiration, but interpreted in the language and writing of man with a man's arm of flesh of fallen nature albeit that his soul is connected to God, and that which can only be written by the perfected spirit of God in his own hand and language, in his own hand and language. This Bible that we read was an inscription of men of flesh who had a connection with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But there is a narrative of a word that a man cannot write or that a man in his most fallen sense and nature cannot write. And it's from there that we understand the law of God. It's from there that we understand the word of God. It's like a person who reads the word, but they read it with human eyes. They study scripture and they study it with human eyes. And then they present it or teach it to those that are watching or listening in with human understandings, with a human language, with a human inscription with a human interpretation, with a human translation. It is different from that which a man carries from God and hands over to men. That's different. That's another glory. That's another realm. And fortunately, Israel did not have the opportunity to read that which was written by the very hand of God. Because remember, when you're discussing the hand of God, when we are dealing, even in Scripture, if you've been a reader of Scripture, you realize that the writings of the hand of God are for two things. Either they seek to impute righteousness or they seek to pass judgment on one. The hand that is written of God, if you remember that man whom he writes on the wall, you've been weighed and found wanting. He judged that fellow. Remember when they bring a woman who was caught in adultery, the scriptures tell us, and the Bible says, according to the customs, the traditions, that woman was supposed to be stoned. And Jesus, he goes down on the ground, the Bible says, and he wrote something on the ground. And when he wrote something on the ground, he stands up and says, let him without sin cast the first stone. And all of them what? walked away. But what is not given to us, what was written by the finger of God in that dot? Because like I said, Every time the hand of the Spirit writes, it's either judging a matter or a man or imputing righteousness on a man. In Isaiah, the 28th uh, chapter, the 16th verse, he says, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I lay in Zion a foundational stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, 
a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. And the 17th verse, he says, Judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet, and the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the water shall overflow the hiding place. You see, this foundation, this stone, is either a one which passes judgment or one that inscribes righteousness. It's two ways. It's twofold. So whatever is written, whatever is passed, whatever is given, is in the sense of either seeking to pass judgment on a thing or to impute righteousness on a thing. What the sons of men in the times of Israel did not know was if God has written the same set of rules or laws, the Ten Commandments, but they were written in his own hand, what was that going to imply? What was the law written in the hand of a perfect God going to imply in the visions of those that read it? in the understanding of those that read it, in the wisdom of those that read it. What was the perfected law of God in a perfect inscription of his hand to do to men of fallen nature? Was it going to redeem them or was it going to judge them? I believe that that which was written and inscribed by the hand of God was to impute righteousness as it deals with their weakness. And God sees that they cannot understand and connect to this righteousness imputed. Because you see, in him is truth and in him is no lie. All perfect gifts come from God. So this is the law of God given in a perfect handwriting of God himself. In his own inscription, it can only cast righteousness. It can only cast deliverance. It can only cast restoration. It can only cast healing to the one that beholds it. Because that's his way. The Bible says he wills that no man perish. He wills that no man perish. And I'm going to come to that. So, he says, all right, it's broken. Let me give them one which, yes, is my law as was the original, but inscribed in the interpretation of human weakness or in the nature in which humanity is. And they could not fulfill it. They could not fulfill it. And here now my argument comes. That which was broken by Moses was the law of God in God's writing as a signification of that which humanity will break as the law of God given with the hand of a man of a flesh. With a man who also was susceptible to weakness like everybody else. He had a temper. He had a temper. Because it's as far as the fallen nature can interpret what God has given that humanity then could connect in service and worship toward God. And the reason why they could not fulfill that which was given was because the only time they come to contact to read it, it's written under the hand of weakness. It's written under the hand of human weakness. The Bible says that the law produces priests with infirmity, with weakness. It's what the Lord does. It maketh men high priests which have infirmity. Why? Because what we read was written by a fallen hand, a fallen nature, albeit that his soul as a man of God, Moses, connected to God, but his flesh was of a fallen nature. He was of weakness. And so let us separate that which God gives us and can write with his own inscription. And let us also look at that which God can give and a man will write with his own inscription. This is man interpreting the law of God. The first one is God giving the law as it is interpreted by him and translated by him for man's understanding. That is the beginning of all clarity in the spirit. So there was no way the law would carry certain clarity. It was to come with a certain obscurity because it's a perfection of God written with a weak hand. So God needs to bring another stone. And not only is this stone for a building, not only is this stone the foundation that holds the whole building, the whole covenant, the whole mystery, the whole temple. But more than that, this new stone also carries a certain inscription. It is again from God, by the hand of God, by the purpose of God, 
by the intent of God. So when this stone is walking on the earth, he says, I do as I see my father do. I'm not come for my own glory, but that I may bring glory to the father. It's speaking the oracles of the father in the most perfect nature and sense concerning the father. And this is Jesus Christ that has come for us. He becomes the cornerstone. And when this Jesus becomes the cornerstone, the narrative starts to change. He tells us, look, on this particular stone, this particular stone, he says, if a man shall fall upon this stone, that man shall be broken. The Bible says, whosoever will try to attack it, to grind it, to him it shall grind. So, whoever falls onto it, the KJV uses the word fall, whoever falls onto this stone, that man shall be broken. But whosoever it shall fall on, it will grind him to powder. That is why... <laughs> When Paul is on his way to Damascus and that bright light comes, Jesus appears to him and says, Soul, soul, why dost thou persecute me? He says, Who are you, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. What does he tell Paul? He tells Paul, You cannot kick against the pricks. This one, you can't kick against it. You cannot do anything to this one. It can only do to you. It can only do to you. You cannot do anything. You cannot do anything to this. You can't break this one. This one is unbreakable. It carries a certain inscription that is 100% God. And so when this second stone, which is the Christ, comes, well, the Son of God comes in the form of also a stone. We see the inscription is the revelation of a higher law, and that law becomes love. He says, I can summarize all that in this. He says it's in the revelation of love that you shall love the Lord God, and that you shall love your neighbor. And he says, if you understand the revelation of agape, he says, besides this, we cannot discuss what Moses gave you. So when we get into the heart to read the inscription of this rock, this stone that we're now dealing with, the New Testament tablet, the person of Christ, it's in the revelation of God's love and love only. It comes to show love. And he that loveth not, the Bible says, no, it's not God, for God is love. For God is love. So the revelation starts to come out. So if so, God is love. Then I believe that that which was inscribed by the hand of God to humanity before it was broken by Moses, it only could have given love. And if it was to be a giver of love, we would see more of an imputation of righteousness than a passing of judgment. And that is what the man of the fallen nature receives and sees the weaknesses of other men he cannot look to his own weaknesses, but then his eyes are looking at the weaknesses of the rest. And what does he do? He smashes that. Because it's what happens every time a man is not aligned in the newness of the spirit and nature. They will always look at the weaknesses of other men and not of your own selves. And that is why some people, and Christians sadly, who have not yet understood the way of grace and the heart of love, every time they are around Christians, they are seeking to point out who is weak and what they've done and what they've not done, who is perfect and that, and who is not perfect and what they've not perfected. And you look at everyone's weakness except your own. Except your own. And that is why it was in that wrath that Moses breaks this. It doesn't matter whether man has fallen. It's not in your responsibility to judge people for their weaknesses. So James says, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. It worketh not the righteousness of God. It worketh not the righteousness of God. God does not redeem men in anger. It's only love that invites men to salvation. It's only love that invites men to repentance. It's only love that invites men you know, to submission. It's only love that invites men to redemption. It's love that invites men to restoration. And that was not known. So Moses breaks. His anger is there. And he thinks that with that, the children of Israel will become better. Yes, they repent for a while. But history has showed us that something in their heart did not change. Because the true revelation of God's intention for the law was not given. Or that which they could read. They can only read it in that which is inscribed with the arm of flesh. With the arm of flesh. Chiseled with the arm of flesh. So... When Jesus comes to this covenant that we are speaking about, in the dying on the cross, in the shedding of his blood for our sins, in Corinthians, he says, and 
when he's having communion with the disciples, he gives thanks. And the Bible says he breaks the bread. And he says, Take, this is my body which is broken for you. This is my body which is broken for you. He's saying this is all that needs to be done for us to have a covenant that cannot be broken. Jesus cannot be crucified again. He cannot. He cannot come back. That's done. It's finished. And the Bible says, is the perfect sacrifice. That's why he uses the word, the propitiation of our sins. Because he's trying to purchase eternal salvation. So when he's killed, broken, that is the last time we see that. Because he has to usher us into a covenant. Which, whoever tries to fall on it, it can only break them. And on whom, so ever it falls onto, it can only grind. In other words, whoever yields to him can only be broken by him. And whoever he goes toward, he can only grind. He cannot be broken and he cannot be smashed anymore. So, we see in the whole understanding of this mystery that in the first covenant, we see a covenant that was broken. In the second covenant, we see a covenant that breaks. We see a covenant that breaks. We see a covenant that grinds. We don't see a covenant that can be broken. When we encounter Jesus, we are broken by him. We are broken by him. No man who has had a true encounter with Jesus Christ can be proud. So when you see pride in the body of Christ in the church today, it is because they have not really, really met Christ as they should. When a man, and I've always said this always in my sermons, and I said that no man who has really met God can be proud. Moses is a typical example. The Bible tells us that Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. Yes, he had his weaknesses of a temper. His temperament was warped and needed a working on. But besides that, the Bible says in Numbers 12, verses 3, Moses was very meek above all the men that were upon the face of the earth. Why was he meek? Because he had encountered God. He had encountered God. When you meet this stone, when you stumble on this stone, it breaks you. It's not broken. Jesus is not intimidated with your crazy life. He's not intimidated with your weakness. No matter how rotten and crazy you are, if you encounter him, he will break you. If he comes to you, he will grind you. And that's the way of the Spirit. So when we're talking about the grace message, it's more than just justification by faith and righteousness imputed. It's the brokenness with which we are broken by a stone that cannot be broken. The inscriptions on it are bending us every day to the will and purposes of God. And as we continue to know God, we become finer and finer as we are refined by the Spirit. You're refined. By his own working, as the word of God gets into us, it cleanses us, it kills us, it bends us, it purifies us. And that is why I don't get it when a man can sit under the truth for 10 years, 20 years, 15 years, 8 years, and they're not broken by God. And they're not humbled by the Spirit. This thing that we preach is there to make you nothing. So it will make Christ everything. When John meets it, he says, I must decrease and he must increase. This is John encountering that same God. How can you say that you are a carrier of Jesus Christ? He is in you. In him you live, move, and have your own being. That you have received him as your personal Lord and Savior. And you're still struggling with pride. You're still self-considered. You still look to justify yourself with your own works. Because you see... Even those which are under the law when grace is come are actually proud because they're saying, look, I know that you can do it through me by faith in you, but I don't want to go that way. No, I want to go the way where I do it myself so that I can show you that with or without your grace, I can do this. And that is the highest form of pride. It's the highest form of pride. It's in everything. It's in even our prayer life. Somebody's repenting and he says, Father, I am sorry. I promise not to do it again. How can you not do it again in your own fallen nature? How many things have you promised God that you're not going to do them again and you find yourself doing the same stuff even worse than you were doing it? Why? Because he's trying to tell you to the point. He says, I'm not against you repenting and saying that you're sorry. I want to see that sorrow, but that tendeth to godliness because there's a sorrow that leadeth not men to repentance. Why? Because to have sorrow is one thing, but to repent 
is a revelation. Metanoia, the changing of your mind, the changing of your vision to know what you truly must behold in repentance. Without true vision, you cannot repent. So there's a blindness even when men are repenting. Oh, I'm sorry. I promise. I promise. This is the last time. You know, God, if I do this, kill me. And then two, three years later, you're doing the same stuff. And you're like, oh God, I think you're going to smite me. Like, uh, I don't show you your time. You're still a kid. Let me wait for you to grow. I was kiddish. I understood you from where you were thinking from. But I'm not in that thought. I'm not in that pattern. I'm not in that way of dealing. Hallelujah. So we see that True repentance is, Father, help me. I feel that my flesh is warring here. But I know that there's a perfection in my spirit with which I have received in you. And that sin should not have dominion over me for I'm not under the law but under grace. And I am fully certain every other day that regardless of anything, I still lean to your grace, your mercy, and power. To work in me both to will and to do according to your good pleasure. I can not in my own strength. So I receive the strength to walk out. I receive the power to walk out. I receive the grace to walk free. That's a man repentant. That's a very repentant man. But I promise, this is the last time. You, You promise in your own flesh. You in your own flesh. The way you know yourself, you're promising God. (laughs) You're promising God. Can we go back to your record of the promises that you have made and how many you've broken concerning the same things, even to your loved ones, your friends? I promise I'm not going to do this. You promise your spouse, you promise your children, you promise your mother, you promise your father, you promise your friends, you promise your pastor, you promise everyone, but you can't. Because in your own strength, you cannot. It can only be done by the purposes and will of God. So this rock cannot be broken. This covenant cannot be broken. On the contrary, it breaks men. On the contrary, it grinds men. If it should come to the man going to it, it can only break him. If it should come to it, putting an encounter for a man, it can only smash him. Paul is an example. Saul of Tarsus. He says you cannot kick against the pricks. This one, if you attack it, it can only prick you. And if it comes to you itself, like the encounter he had on Damascus, it could only be shattered. After three days, we see Saul of Tarsus, a very different man. That was a man who was smashed by God. (laughs) And so with all his pomp and regalia, the glory that he has as a nace of Judaism, we now see that melting to nothingness. And for all things that were gained to me, and I remember he says, I was a son of the Pharisee, circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of the Benjamite, as touching the law of Pharisee, as concerning the zeal, persecuting the church, as touching the righteousness, which is of the law, blameless. But he says, but for all of those things which were gained to me, he says, those I have counted loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, and for whom I have counted all things but dung, that I may win him. And he says, and that yet yeah, doubtless that I will be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, even the righteousness of God, that in that I shall conform to know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable to his death. If peradventure, I'll see that glory and attain the resurrection of the dead. That's a man who has been shattered by the rock. That's a man who has been humbled by the Christ. And that is why then, when you understand this message, You respect the experiences of the Spirit. Because I have heard people who have testified about experiences, albeit in a very proud manner. And sometimes I question, is this the very rock that I read about? Because the one that I know breaks men. It ain't get men out of an encounter into pride. In fact, even when Paul is giving an example of his encounter, when he goes to the third heaven and he sees things which were not lawful to utter, what was the language he uses? He says, it's expedient for me, doubtless, to glory, but I will come to visions and revelations. It's not expedient, he says. It's not important for me to glory. It's not about me. I don't even need to boast about this. In fact, for me, where I'm at, this is what Paul is trying to tell you, that I should not even be boasting about this. It's not expedient for me to glory. 
You know, he knows that he's dead, yet he liveth, yet not him, but Christ liveth in him. And the life that he now lives, he lives by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for him. So he knows there is no point in him that should glory. Even when he's talking about the third dimension of the spirit, you see a man approaching the testimony of divine encounter with the humility of spirit. Because he knows that it did not begin with him and neither can it end with him. Jesus is the author and the finish of that faith. He is the beginning and the end. When you keep that mind, when you keep that understanding, you will see that it is natural, it is normal for a new creation. It should be that at the sound of that name, at the understanding of that person, your life is going to humble more. Your life is going to break more. Your life will become contrite. Why? Because you encountered something that can only break you, but that you cannot break. You encountered one that can shatter you to nothingness, that he'll truly live in you. That is the Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That is the rock with a true inscription. That is the rock with which we behold, and when we look to him, all things change. When our eyes go to him, the things of the earth grow strangely dim. The man of a song said, and in the light of his glory and grace, he says that is a far more excellent covenant. That is a far more glorious one. When we enter this realm, we don't cover ourselves with a veil as of thinking that the glory of God will diminish on us because it's not us and him. It is actually him and entirely him. In him we live, move, and have our own being. So the glory that shines on us is by the inscription of the Father. So he calls us written epistles, known and read by all men, written in our hearts as we are manifestly shown to be these things. They are preaching about us. The gospel is us and we are the gospel. And this time it's not the ink of men. It's not the ink of false scribes. It's not the ink of men of flesh or weakness. It is the ink of the spirit in its perfection. We now carry that form. So when we behold this thing, this understanding, this revelation, its own fullness. You will never wake up dry. You will never wake up weak. You will never wake up inefficient. Because the Bible says the sufficiency is not of us. As of to think of anything of ourselves. But it says, but the sufficiency is of God, which has made us able ministers of the new covenant. And so in this relationship, we totally yield and fall on him. We lean on him. That's what the Bible calls trusting. To trust means you lean your entire personality on him. Whoever leans falls onto. See? Whoever leans falls onto. You lean your entire personality on him. You submit entirely to him. And as you submit to him, he gets that habit out of you. He gets anger out of you. He gets frustration out of you. He gets uh, craziness out of you. He gets that madness out of you. He, you know, he gets that unfaithfulness out of you. He gets laziness out of you. He gets perversion out of you. You know, he gets all laxity out of you. He gets slothfulness out of you. He gets all darkness out of you. And before you know that, you're shining every other day as you lean and walk on with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You fall on him, he breaks you. He falls on you, he shatters you. For every experience as of whether you are the one that began this or he is the one that came to you, he will not be broken, he will break. And that is why I am certain that I'm going to heaven because I cannot break this. He began that work. He sees it to accomplishment. The Christ is the author and the finish of our faith. I am going to heaven because I know nothing of myself. I look to him, the author and finisher. Looking unto Jesus, the Bible says. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Not looking at anything. Oh, that should, you know, divert you. Looking unto Jesus, which is the author and the finisher of our faith. I want you to just raise your voice and thank God for the New Testament. Thank God for the New Testament. Thanks. Thanks. I give you thanks 
for all you done. I am so blessed. My soul is a rest. Oh Lord, I give you thanks. Oh Lord, I give you thanks. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest flame. But holy trust in Jesus' name. Help me quiet. On Christ the solely. Thank you. Thank him. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy hill, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the soul. the next verse he's for his coven and his blood support me in the whelming flood when all around my soul gives way he then is all my hope and stay on Christ the solid rock I stand shall come with trumpet sound oh may I then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne on Christ the solid rock I stand all of the ground Sinking sand, all oh, at the ground is sinking sand. I pray for you that may He still be your vision and Lord of your life, that He'll stay Savior and nothing else. That you will lean not on your strength, not on your ability, not on your own potential, not in your own wisdom, but that in all ways acknowledge him, his person, his truth, his love, his identity, and his work at the cross. And that you will entirely lean on him that he will break you. Or that he will continue to crush the things in you that are carnal, that he will continue dealing with you in all aspects of your life, I pray. That may God bend you, may he kill you, may he humble you even as he humbles the things that are surrounding you. Because you're called of him and it's his responsibility to do that in your life. This covenant is different from the old. The old men break, the new breaks you. Thank you, Lord. If the sick receive your healing right now, in Jesus' name. Whatever sickness is on your life, I rebuke it, I curse it from the root, and I speak healing 
in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. You're free. You're free. You're free. If you're there and you've never given your life to Christ, you're not born again. I want to give you an opportunity to lean. I want to give you an opportunity for accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. There is no name given among men by which men are saved, save the name of Jesus. At the sound of that name, every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of the Father. This is the only opportunity that you have. Not tomorrow, not next week. I cannot guarantee what's going to happen to you next year. But I can guarantee that something is going to change in your life tonight as you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You repeat these words after me. You say, Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. I've moved in my own abilities my own strength, my own understanding. But now I am broken. I seek to receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. Tonight, I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 41 466 4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest. <laughs>